Um, I'm a visual anthropologist and a documentary filmmaker. I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, I'm 32 years of age and I've been living all my life in different countries from Portugal, Spain, India to England and now in Switzerland. Um, so for me to talk about home is a very puzzling terrain um, because I feel like I have lots of homes um, in lots of different geographical locations but also home for me is not a very physical entity also because of the kind of life I experienced. Um, there are often times I feel also very homeless um, because not again in the physical sense but more in the sense of belonging um, because I've been in between lots of cultures and also beyond them so I can't really say I have a very fixated identity and I think home is very very particular in looking at identity formations but maybe this was a very anthropological response and to make it more personal um, for me, home is where I feel the safest. I can easily tell you that, that this is really how I see home. I see it as safety. And when that safety is uh, endangered and shaken, I also experienced that my world was tur turned upside down. Um, so it is a shelter. It is a place of... Um, comfort, a place of uh, knowing uh, more than anything, knowing that you you are fine. Um, so then if I feel safer at other homes too, then I can adapt. I felt like I had this tendency to adopt them as my second home, third home, fourth home. So uh, it's a very interesting, uh, I think, uh, it's very interesting to think about this. So maybe I stop here and if you have any questions or... Yes, maybe um, <coughs> you've once done a, a document, documentary on refugee, here I am, I think it's called. So on, on a refugee in Turkey, I think. Um, did that change your, your perception of home? Like, because well, refugees have to leave their home, find maybe a new one if they can, if they are welcome. Well, how did that change for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, meeting Enzo Ika, my friend, brother for life, uh, who migrated from Congo to Turkey. Actually, he was on his way to France and a lot of situations just made him end up there in Istanbul. And meeting him absolutely changed my perspective about what migration is. Um, because I've never been someone studying migrants, because I think that's very colonial to say I'm studying a migrant. But I've been looking into migration self-reflexively, and I did share this self-reflection uh, with the people I collaborated. So Enzo is one of, one of those people who opened my eyes into different ways of seeing migration and also showing me uh, with great inspiration that human beings, uh, although one person, even one person can change big structures um, that can make a difference in the way that it can be experienced by other people. So I think this transformative aspect of migration uh, what that journey can is enabling human beings to achieve is is fascinating to look at because oftentimes you find political and academic discourses just concentrated on the power structures and little known uh, on what human beings are able to <clears throat> achieve so i think there is this transformative uh, shift going on in the world which is great um so definitely, I think my um, friendship with him has really made a difference. Um, 
and that also taught me that home is a constant act of making it it's not a stable it's not a, a static entity you are constantly homing and uh, also you are constantly unhomed in so many levels that's true yes but you were uh, already mentioning um, the word transformation and do you think home can serve as a seedbed for for transformation or as a um yes how how can home evolve as a as a place where transformation can start can take place can have an impact on other can you tell us a bit about that definitely um so you see who is dwelling in this home i think we ask we start also where is this home what is this home for where i consider home in istanbul is in a neighborhood uh, that historically had to do with uh, families whose spouses, particularly men, working in the army, so serving uh, for the sovereignty of the nation state. So I do come from a family uh, of an army. So how can I say that? Uh, my father's father, my grandfather, was uh, serving to the military, um, you know, as a high ranking official. And so their families were living in this particular neighborhood. Um, but also, um, so this is, um, this is, this starts as a tradition in the family by the foundation of the country. So Turkey was founded in 1928. Uh, before that, um, my father's family were actually cave dwellers in central Anatolia, in Turkey. So they were actually uh, people called as troglodytes, people who lived in caves and were doing farming and they were actually keeping vineyards and they were living in a very ecologically interesting place where, because the, there was not much water, it was a very dry area, dry area. Um, they had to, uh, keep uh, pigeons, like lots of pigeons, in order to collect their manure to fertilize the soil. So this is very interesting, you know. So we come from a peasant society, uh, a very uh, secluded lifestyle. I mean, it could be easily compared to the Tibetans uh, of, you know, Tibet. Um, there, even the ways women used to braid their hair and the way they dressed looked really alike to me, which is incredible. So, <clears throat> and this uh, village, this region is called Cappadocia, which has become a UNESCO World Heritage Site during the 80s. So following the societal transformations, my family also transformed from homing, dwelling in caves, um, living a mutual uh, life with the ecology and environment into becoming the protectors of the new forming nation state and then coming all the way till today, which is a very unterritorial way of being like my generation. So this is my father's side. And uh, my grandmother is actually a, um, a born, a Bozniak refugee. A, a, she was born as a refugee um, for a very short time as she had to migrate from Bosnia Herzegovina with her uh, mother. She was wrapped in a carpet and taken to Istanbul. Um, and this is because uh, it was right at the World War I and um, the grandmother of my grandma, the mother of my grandmother saw Franz Ferdinand being shot. Uh, so they experienced this historical moment and because they were Muslims, they had to, uh, you know, leave the Christian territory. So this is very interesting, you know, um, I have peasants, cave dwellers, soldiers, um, refugees, which was also a very short period because then they, they 
at that time, I think, because citizenship didn't exist at that time, right? It was a different ideology and way of belonging. Um, at that time in the Orient, people were talking about Ummet, the Ummah and the Khalifa. And so there wasn't this notion of citizenship at that time, which formed later. And my family became one of the first citizens of Turkey because of being uh, occupying the right ethnicity, you know, the, being Turkish, which is also a very complex uh, situation in our country. So um, I think knowing this, discovering my roots and reflecting on my own family history helped me understand what is home. Because home could be uh, your origins, you know, so whenever I go to Cappadocia, I feel this incredible sense of peace. Uh, it's a very historical, mythological, surreal landscape. You know, it's it was it appeared because of the um, the 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 land was formed by the eruption of a volcano. So when you look into the into the pictures, you would be amazed to see it looks like a moon surface. So from there to <laughs> to Istanbul's armies and it's just a big radical shift and transformation and this tells our own lives I mean um, we do belong to transforming societies so the notion of our home will change so by the time I was coming into these realizations living in Istanbul um, meeting you know Enzo, a Congolese refugee, then meeting Maiza al Hafez, uh, who fled from Syria that time. And like being with them, I've seen how they were constantly making, recreating their own communities of support, how they were looking into in being included, participating in the neighborhoods, and how they were actually making their own homes. And I found a lot of similarities because they also have. Uh, they're also coming from transforming society. So I realized that we are not really different at all. We have differences, of course, you know, Enzo is a French speaking man um, who, who is now fluent in Turkish and in English. <clears throat> uh, you know, Maiza is an Arabic speaking woman who's fluent in French, English, and now even Turkish. So it's uh, it wasn't that difficult to communicate at all no but uh, like seeing how we are uh, beings part of bigger transformations that helps you understand and locate who you are but this doesn't necessarily mean that only these transformations shape you because you you are also uh, um, you have the capacity to also enact your own transformation the transformation you want to see around you so I worked for more inclusive cities. Um, I, I, I advocated for an Istanbul that it, would, that it not just belonged to Turks, but it should belong to everyone who, who decided to inhabit there. So a less territorial, less nationalist approach. And that's what I use the idea of home, the various home idea I have <laughs> uh, in bringing that out. Well, thank you for sharing us the story of your different homes. <laughs> um, I would give the opportunity to Leandra to ask a question at this point. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting, especially to see that not only you have had a very um, fluid sense of home and an ever-changing way of what home means, but also your entire family and that it's embedded in your history to to change or to um, find home wherever you are and to not understand home as a physical entity as you said but more as a concept that um, that was really very interesting and now I'm um, thinking about since you are one of the co-founders of Home for Humanity what were the things that you felt home for humanity needed to be a true home. Um, exactly. So home for humanity plays a, a vital role in my understanding of what home means and what home could be and what 
a home is capable of doing uh, or giving into the world. And that's right at the time when I was realizing about my own history, that's the time when I was actually reflecting myself in relation to a lot of questions I had on migration, uh, writing my PhD dissertation. So that's the time uh, because I did my studies in Bern. It is not too far from Hotons. Um, like with the train, I used to take the train ride, which wasn't, it didn't take me even four hours to get to Home for Humanity. So yeah, being in close proximity to their, to Alexander's and Rama's home, I think was one major reason why I had the chance to be there quite often. Um, but this is not the only reason, of course, there were uh, more, <laughs> uh, there were better reasons to to keep going there and you know the other one of the other founding members is Pius um, who lives in who is also originally from Bern but lives in Italy uh, also at the same time so uh, Pius used to drive me from Bern on his way to Home for Humanity too and you know we had this hours and hours of conversations on what Home for Humanity should be for what it should be what kind of space that could be co-created and of course i mean alexander and rama they were already they planted the seeds of it and they were already living and enacting it but i think they wanted to share this um uh with also me pius and thais who's from brazil um and arjuna you know their son uh into making it a more of an experience of the commons you know because of course, um, having two people is already a big, big, big uh, collaboration. But then having more collaborators uh, enacts newer possibilities into what you know Home for Humanity can achieve. And uh, so this is one side of the story. The second side of the story is again related to my PhD and my work with Enzo and Misa. Uh, Rama and I met in 2013 in Istanbul, actually, for the first time at a peace UN IOM peace event in France Palace. And Enzo was invited to um, uh, give a talk, a brief talk, but as well accompany Rama with his music as she recited poetry, uh, as she was taking. Um, enacting the theater of transformation. Uh, that's the first time we met there. And then we went to an Ethiopian restaurant. And th that was the time I got the chance to, I was there filming Enzo, right? So because we were doing this documentary, so it's this coincidence. It's like me becoming Enzo's shadow. And that's how I <laughs> learned of Rama. And of course, Rama as a storyteller, she was really interested in this. She wanted to know, you know, why and so what were we trying to achieve and ever since we kept in touch and a few more times she came to Istanbul um, very regularly and she met the research participants of my uh, PhD the unaccompanied asylum seeking youth and she was with me she spent a whole day with me uh, and with the youth whom we had an amazing day to, together and it was I think this experience really touched her and stayed with her. And so that's how we started. And then, you know, being in Bern again, and she had lots of events going on in UN, in Geneva, in, in the Graduate Institute, in Geneva Academy. So I, I started like supporting her with the filming of her events. So there was this very nice artistic, but as well as scholarly engagement between us. And because of that friendship, um, I was uh, on and off being invited to the home. And then at some point it came to the level that Rama said, you know, you are um, exactly 20 years younger than me. And I, I was calling her a sister at that time. And she said, you know, um, you could easily be my daughter <laughs> because of the 20 years of difference. And I was like, well, if you want to be a mother of mine, I mean, that's uh, an honor, I mean, but I can't ask such thing because I think you are extremely, in my opinion, very youthful and uh, beautifully 
you know, um, you can't really, I mean, when you put us together, you can't say she's my mother. And she's like, no, no, I insist that I be your mother. <laughs> So can you imagine? And of course, uh, she wanted to adopt me as a daughter because of many reasons, but mostly uh, spiritual connections. But also that time, those were very precarious times in Turkey. And she was convinced that they should adopt me uh, into France and I shouldn't worry about the political uh, sufferings in Turkey. So that was really beautiful, very nice. So by adopting me, I think this was one of the the first steps in the creation of Home for Humanity to the, today as an association because um, it's really how it is, you know, you adopt strangers into your life and they become your family. So that's how you expand. That's how you, um, because if, imagine, I mean, if you were always with your inner circle of family and you never adopted strangers as husbands, wives, you know, children, that doesn't happen. I mean, that enlargement doesn't take place. So yeah, so this adoption uh, was a key thing. So in this way, also Alexander became my father. And <laughs> this is amazing, you know, it's just beautiful. <clears throat> I do have a follow-up question, but I just want to say it's so lovely that they adopted you and that you're part of the family and seeing you talk about it is so nice with your big smile on your face. So really, really lovely to hear. Um, but the, the follow-up question is because with this interview series that I am doing is about the North where... Um, we talk about knowledge and co-creation and collaborative evolution. And you have talked about a lot of these points where you were talking about your scholarly, but also artistic collaboration with, with Rama. Um, so would you say this learning is, it, it is a learning that takes place, this um, co-creation and how mm -hmm. do you think this, um, can bring other people forward? How, how do you engage this co-creative mm -hmm. learning? I mean, exactly. So co-creative learning was just a tool for us. Um, we had, uh, what brought us together was the vision of creating this transformation. What does it mean really when we talk about transformation? All these things that we talked, but broadly we wanted to support people's liberation. So we wanted to support people's freedom. Um, that's why scholarly engagement wasn't satisfying enough because it was just uh, on the conceptual level and it didn't promise any change. And even restricted change. And that's when you start to question, but that's, in my opinion, when, uh, was unacceptable that, for instance, you know, let's start with this very simple logic. I'm doing a PhD with youth who are going, who are on the verge of life and death, right? 2015, many of them crossed the Mediterranean Sea in dinghy boats, experienced, I mean, they were about to drown some of them and survive and, you know, all of that. So I'm working with people looking at experiences of people who are going through hell. And I'm expected to write a book about them. And in return, I get credentials. I get a PhD. I become a doctor. Maybe in the future, I become a professor. And don't I do anything? Don't I give back to the people that I owe so much through their stories? Because it's through their experience I gain this knowledge. So it was very logical and even a humane response more than you know scholarly but also i mean there needs to be this kind of giving and taking relationship that um somehow needs to be balanced otherwise i'm exploiting it otherwise i'm colonizing it so this was the 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 reason i was like oh i need to do something and rama was the right person because 
she had this years of experience working on the policy level and the conceptual level, but then also who was burning with the desire of, you know, improving people's lives in terms of liberties, rights, and mostly political rights, but as well as, you know, also, uh, she also come to see like the need to healing, you know, because this is a very traumatic experience, people who go through conflict and violence. Um, so this was our, our uh, collaboration and use of co-creative artistic methods is just the tool, uh, but the essential vision is to liberate people, is to, uh, is to work for a global uh, freedom, which which is a very difficult to achieve, but not impossible. Um, so for Rama, there there are uh, lots of uh, occasions where we should keep on imagining and working for um, awakening as many as possibilities. Uh, so so I loved her. Um, theater of transformation method and methodology and even applied that in my first with my own self I applied the methodology within my own self for my own healing and uh, also with my participatory work with the youth um, so she gave me a book actually she gave me a tool to to achieve that and and because this is a relational process then in return, she also had lots of inspiration, you know, meeting young people, meeting Enzo and Misa, and, and we did this uh, one event, United Against Borders, at Home for Humanity, which was incredible. Lots of artists from conflicted areas of the world came to Home for Humanity. Um, and then they did a choreography together, a performance together, and enacted it in the UN library in front of policymakers, I filmed the event. And I think that that film, like the whole thing, the whole experience empowered the artists so much that uh, it even took part in Misa's political asylum into Netherlands. So it is possible that we really did uh, use arts and policy and research and scholarly engagement in a, such an interdisciplinary way that it really changed people's lives. Um, but of course, of course, working on personal level with, you know, uh, a few people is the way you start. And then our ambition is really to enact this global transformation. Uh, so a lot more people can liberate from uh, violence and the structures that slave them, enslave them. Um, so this is the kind of world we inhabit in our <laughs> in our minds, um, and maybe sometimes it's tiring, right? Because you just want to enjoy your coffee and just don't think about these matters at all. And there are times like that too. Thank God, I'm not always thinking about how to save the world, but um, I think at some point in every people's lives there is a phase like this but with some people maybe it becomes their life ambition you know so i i can't judge anyone or i can't say like we are the coolest people or something but we are on a constant struggle we are never letting it go i think this is why uh, we came together the kind of people that came together that comes together at home for humanity are this kind of people people who never let go of their vision. So, um, you have obviously a lot of um, experience dealing with difficult circumstances in not only your own life, but also in the people that you worked with and you, you collaborated with. Um, and we have also tried to think about this current global crisis um, of the coronavirus, which is different to other crises because it is such a global um, uh, concern, which could bring us together or could separate us in, in different ways. Um, so with your background, what are your thoughts on, on how we can um, emerge out of this in a, in a stronger way? 
Um, what I believe is the the experience of isolation, I think, is what touched most uh, people and the fear of losing loved ones, um, particularly the young ones, you know, whom are not under uh, direct threat, but are under the threat of uh, mental, you know, hazards, because uh, we value and there's so much people we care who are much elderly and maybe have conditions that are making them vulnerable in front of the virus. So first, this fear. Second, this isolation. Third, you're not allowed to touch people. You know, there is this incredible, for the first time in our lives, our bodies, our simple bodies became weapons, uh, possible weapons to uh, the deterioration of someone's health. And this is not, these are not easy things to deal with. This is a, is a big trauma for, I think it's a global trauma for everyone, even for us who are very healthy physically, um, but we have now this mental issue, all of us, you know, how am I gonna touch again another human being? Um, except those that are in the very inner circle and you know, so, so this troubles me a lot as in, you know, what's going to happen to our human connection? Um, is this situation going to be abused by crisis with capitalists? Is this going to be abused by nation states who will use this as, a, as an excuse just to, to make lives for <laughs> migrants hell again? Um, somehow the migrants, wherever they go, they're like always, they become the scapegoat, you know, they become the black sheep. Although all nations in this world are built on the labor of the migrants. So this hypocrisy and um, these fears I have in mind and questions I have in mind, is this going to be a breakdown, you know, or... Um, Will humanity go through a breakthrough saying, now I have more empathy, I have more understanding of what refugees, migrants are going through or what um, people with less, less safety, how are they uh, providing for their, for their families at times when they're not allowed to go out and work? Uh, because the world was divided, you know, of those who were fearing if they stay home, they, they will go hungry. And those who are stuck at home, who keep eating because <laughs> of this emotional eating disorder and who are worried of get, becoming fat, you know, so this was, I'm, I'm maybe oversimplifying the situation, but really there were people who were, who are complaining for eating too much, being stuck at home and those who are in fear that they won't find anything to eat because they can't work. So this just exposed everything that is wrong in this world, it, everything became so transparent all of a sudden. And this is the moment of big change, either to the worse or to the better. Of course, because I am in nature a very optimistic person, I, I will say, tell you that things will get better. This is my defense mechanism, maybe. I refuse, I refuse, I refuse to uh, think that there is no hope. And um, let's see, I may be, it's still early for me to say something because it's still in the making, but it is true we are in a turning point and big transformation is already happening. So let's see, is it for the better or not? But I can also tell you that although these worries, there are lots of good solidarity actions happening around the world. So this is already very promising. Yes, the, these really sound very promising and it might be even a, a way to create more unity and cohesion in the world. Maybe, um, hopefully, um, try to be more optimistic as well uh, <laughs> than pessimistic and see the downsides. Um, but since many people now face this inner chaos um, or this uncertainty in their homes, could you maybe give us a, a hint or an advice 
especially also for us young people how how can we start our own transformative journey how can we you know work on this unity on this cohesion in the world how can we go on this journey of of um Yes, you know, working together, bringing us together in a way. What is your tip? How did you um, go about in, in, in your last years or in your life? I think for the time being, since, you know, you are physically stranded at home and... Uh, also maybe in your neighborhood and for a while maybe in your own country because we don't know when the lockdown is going to be over um, I would definitely recommend to work in inner inner well-being and inner reflections and um, just to be very calm for a while because of course once things improve and people are free again whatever that means <laughs> then you will of course have the chance to travel and you know go around meet people engage with people got to learn a lot of different cultures and so on which is beautiful but since we are not able to do that right now of course reading and listening as much as possible but also listening to your own inner um inner because this is a time of great um, like uh, the health is not well the the world uh, um is suffering it's it's like there is this well-being problem so i would concentrate on the notion of well-being uh what can you possibly do to improve your own well-being and how can your energy uh contribute to that unity so i think what you're doing now you know you are engaging with us and then you will make this more visible uh by spreading these ideas is already a big step forward and in the meanwhile you know taking it calm make sure you take care of yourselves good and uh, yeah I, I suppose my first recommendation is self-care and as much as energy you have to use it to uh, give back to the world with um, th this kind of very innovative projects so you could put potentially come up more of your own projects also in the future um so and for that you just need to keep on reading and listening and you know just constantly learn learning i suppose well talking about learning i will give it back to leandra she has one more question about that thank you <laughs> um Yes, one of the questions that I wanted to ask all of the Northern interviews is um, a very simple one, but one that connects uh, wisdom, learning and home. And it is, um, what is one thing that your mother taught you? There is so much that my mother's, I have two mothers, right? So, <laughs> so we know what my mother Rama has taught me. Uh, never giving up uh, on the vision and uh, my biological mother Suheila uh, she taught me to be um, from her point of view uh, I was capable of doing and achieving everything so I think this feeling uh, she passed it to me very effectively <laughs> She never restricted me from anything and, you know, always very supportive about realizing my own potential. So I think this is what she, because that's what she gave me. This is what I feel like giving to every young people I meet, um, particularly with, the, with, with, um, with all the people who are yeah, younger than me or even older than me. doesn't matter actually the age, but I feel like I should contribute and support in everybody's own um, journey of realizing their own potentials. So this is what I have. Um, I'm not into this, you know, self-indulged approach of how great I am, how talented I am. 
I see no meaning in that. So there is this, um, this compassion that comes to me from, um, and I'm not saying this as in a religious way, or I'm not saying this in a, but I'm seeing this in a spiritual, spiritual, but also the most logical, most intellectual stance, because um, my well-being is dependent on your well-being and your well-being is dependent on my well-being, right? So I think this point is made very clear with what we are going today. So this is thanks to my mother that I have always this feeling, you know, always nurture other people, always nurture everything around you because this is directly related to you. Maybe it's even selfish still to, to think this way um, because whatever we do, we are beings who are coded to survive. That's life. Life equals survival. So it's very normal that we, need, we should think this way. This is our nature. If we want to survive, we need to make our lives, each other's lives better. We can't, uh, we can't say, oh, there is a war there. Let me get their petrol and just live comfortably in my flat having electricity i mean how dumb how illogical how stupid approach so thankfully just hoping this stupid approach is going to end so when it comes to recommendation i really really recommend you read and um, watch all talks and books from vandana shiva because she's one of my role models because she has this book called, you know, Soil But Not Oil. And there is this new book called Oneness Versus 1%. So she talks about, you know, how humans can unite against the 1%, the privileged 1%, the billionaires who want to kind of rule the world and so on. So do, at your spare times, do read, watch her conversations. It's going to make so much sense. Um, so our future is an environmental one, is a spiritual one, and less of, you know, um, economic one, I need to say. Should be, I mean, because it's not sustainable what, what the life we are in right now. So maybe to come back as a, as a small conclusion, coming back to our home, to, to make your home, technically. Um, could you maybe show us one specific object or a book uh, or, or place that you represent or that you connect most with your home or your inner home? Okay, maybe an object. Um, like, I mean, maybe I show you, I've, I've shown you this corner before, but... Um, so here in this corner behind me, you see uh, musical instruments. Actually, we, I live with my boyfriend here and uh, both of us, we are not um, like, we did not master any of these instruments. I mean, we are trying. <laughs> so, but the drums, which are much easier to play, um, it's like for us it's like therapy you know we uh we just create sounds of our feelings what we feel like and it's it really helps to tune in to tune in when we are particularly untuned and then there are uh, images uh from our life life views and um uh, memories that we like to remember there is this little flag of tibet because for me uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, his compassion and what he's been giving to the world is so sacred and I love Tibetan culture and um, everything that Tibet represents that I'm hoping that will also come to a happy uh, ending one time, one day. And then we have lots of flowers and a, and a huge plant <laughs> uh, on our bookshelf. Um, so 
I think we just try to bring in everything that we love, you know, music, books, um, the artists in the in these, you know, they're Kurdish artists who have these incredible voices of whose names I'm not able to pronounce correctly. And lots of books that I that I read and write that I love reading of, you know, Maya Angelou, I know why the caged bird sings, or Angela Davis, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, or Rama, The Gift of Peace. So, or Alexander's book, Integral Development, Integrity. Um, so Gandhi's, Dalai Lama's, Vandana Shiva's, uh, bell hooks, all the kind of people. So it's like kind of a little universe, a corner, uh, a universe that is just a bit more um, coming into concrete of what I have in the mind and in the soul. Um, and then, you know, these colors I like, um, these colors of pink, green, and blue. Somehow there is this uh, coming from my visits to Morocco and maybe I come close to show you finally the stones that I collected uh, from my visits to Morocco. Um, I love them. It's, they just give me good energy, you know. <laughs> um, and maybe I make a sound for you also. Um, maybe I just show you also some of the books here. Um, maybe here, you know, who I have that I will read soon. Um, yeah, this one, Maya Angelou, I, I wanted to read it for a long time. Uh, Paulo Freire is another author I really love. Um, just, I like this image. It's just a postcard I found in one of the cafes in Bern <laughs> of women working. Um, and then I also like the stone a lot. You know, when you look at it from the outside, it's just uh, a stone, you know, doesn't really show anything. But when you look inside the stone, you see the jewel, it's shining. It's so unexpected, but this is how I see human beings, you know. We all have this uh, inner talents and beauties that needs to be revealed. But for that, you need to crack the stone. You need to crack the hardness, the borders of your, you know, of your being. So you can really show the world, you can really... Um, then also there are stones that I found in the mountains of High Atlas. I'm, I just took some because they were so beautiful. Um, like this one also, I found it. You cannot believe this one I found. <laughs> so there was a moment in my life where I was like obsessed with collecting these beautiful stones, like a, a bit of a treasure hunter, you know? <laughs> Um, and then, of course, there are these kind of stones that, you know, I love touching. Um, and here's something inspired from Rama, actually. Um, you see this uh, stone corner again with the, the, the sign of infinity. Because I, I do remember at her home, she has this corner as well. So I think, you know, I was really inspired. And this one is a fossil, so to remind us for, for our the ancient wisdom, you know, like, um, like, because I do read a lot on well-being also, uh, the Amchi, he's uh, Dalai Lama's Amchi, and a Tibetan medic practitioner, and I really like that a lot because in 2012 I I made that film with uh, the Tibetan doctor also. She's one of the one of the first Tibetan 
woman doctors. Uh, I met her in Ladakh. And this was another very transformative journey for me to think of what well-being is, what, um, what healing is, what does that mean? Because um, this uh, Tibetan medicine is highly, um, works through the ideas of preventive healthcare, <clears throat> that you eat and live correctly so you don't get ill. So, you know, if public healthcare was uh, better off today, there would be less people now in, in uh, emergency rooms. So it's very important that our ideas on well-being change immediately. Um, yeah, so, you know, I could potentially talk for hours, which I shouldn't, but um, it's a small corner, but it has the worlds in it for me. Um, and then finally, I can show you our huge terrace. So now I come to the, um, to the kitchen and I will show you the terrace where we spend time in the open air. Um, so there was a hammock today. We didn't put it because of the rain. And our flowers, we just started planting them. You see a lot of flowers there. Um, that's it. 